Hello, and welcome to this edition of Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I am Margaret Chin, and I represent City Council District 1, which includes Lower Manhattan. I'm also the chair of the New York City Council Committee on Aging. In New York City, one out of five seniors live in poverty. Seniors are also the fastest growing population in the city and will account for 20% of the population by 2030. There is enormous demand for senior housing in the city that elderly New Yorkers can't afford. To discuss this issue, I'm joined by Bobby Sackman, Director of Public Policy at Live On New York, and Susan Wright, an architect and member of the AIA New York Design for Aging Committee. Thank you both, both for being here today. So Bobby, many New Yorkers agree that preservation and construction of affordable housing is important, but there are few available sites. In our crowded city, where can we build senior housing? First, thank you for inviting me here today. Um, Live On New York has a senior housing coalition comprised of, 20 of uh, 25 of the leading nonprofit housing providers across the city. And so we take this very seriously. And you're right, land is very tight here. Mm -hmm. Land is gold. And Live On New York has produced a report that identifies parking lots that are attached to current senior housing, known as 202 housing. And this, these parking lots are very underutilized, maybe four or five cars average uh, using them. And we've done a report that identifies parking lots around the city that could be turned into senior housing, affordable senior housing. So they would be right next door to another senior housing building. One is actually in your district on, on Norfolk Street. Mm -hmm. um, and we believe that what we're bringing to the table is a tool to say, you know, look at this land and, and then go to the city and the local communities to build. What we need to decide in this city is what's more important sometimes. Do we use the land for affordable senior housing or for another purpose? These parking lots are just for seniors who live in the buildings. They're not mm -hmm. general municipal lots. And we need to make a decision that we want to keep seniors in the community. We call it aging in place. Let them stay in the buildings. Let them stay in the community they've lived in for a long time and help them stay there with services. So uh, we, we think that this is the future. Seniors are anchors in communities. We need them to stay. Yeah, at the same time that, I mean, the city is getting more and more expensive. Right. So some of the seniors are fortunate, you know, to have a place to live, but how are they how can they afford to pay the rent? So even seniors that are in rent-regulated apartments mm -hmm. or on senior citizen rent increase exemption known as SCRI, they're still on the fiscal cliff. Many of them are paying 50% or more of their income in rent. And that's unsustainable over time. There's something they're not buying. It's mm -hmm. not food, maybe, or they're not buying medication to keep that going. Um, the program known as SCRI is very underutilized. Only 43% of people eligible use it. 70,000 more seniors could be using SCRI across the city. Well, the city's calling it right now a rent, rent freeze. freeze program. A rent know? freeze. So I would encourage all, not just older adults, but even their adult children to call 311, call your local council office, city council office, and find out about how to freeze your mom or dad's rent. We need, program, <coughs> excuse me, we need programs out there that preserve current housing. Mm -hmm. They, pres they uh, protect the rent-regulated stock. But we also need buildings that target lower-income seniors so that they can grow old in basically a safe haven. We could bring services in. There could be perhaps community space there that the whole community mm -hmm. uses, not just the tenants of the building. And this is the future of our city with the numbers of seniors um, growing in number, the diversity of the senior population. They're part of the community, and this is how we can keep people there. I mean, I have visited many uh, senior buildings that have um, senior center right in the building. Mm -hmm. And Susan, I mean, you helped design several of the self-help community service facility uh, in Queens. What are some of the challenges of building affordable housing in the city? 
Um, affordable housing, sure. affordable housing for seniors. Sure. And again, thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy that the AIA committee is, you know, invited to talk about this really important issue for us. Um, the biggest challenge for uh, developing senior housing is is finding the funding for it. I mean, it is um, finding the land, which is something that Bobby's group has identified. It's a great idea to um, take this underutilized parking space and actually have it as effectively free land. Um, so finding the funding um, it could take a very long time to put together a new construction senior housing project. I do market rate work as well as affordable work, and um, a typical market rate project might be two years from sort of the initial idea to the date when people move in. A typical affordable housing project might be four years. That's sort of a more typical uh, period of time. So that's that is a you know it takes a lot of commitment. Um, so the risk is you know there's there are a lot of different funding sources, but you have to cobble them all together to actually make the project work. That means that you have a lot of uh, different goals from different parties. So um, it's very important that you know um, oh, I've lost my train of thought on it. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to go back to what you really asked me, which was about what to do at, it, at the self-help properties in Flushing. I mean, those properties have, um, they're built as nonprofit residents for the elderly, which is a zoning term in New York City that allows a little bit of additional floor area to be built for a building that's going to have seniors over 62 who are low income developed by a not-for-profit developer. So that's a real zoning boost for, for projects. In exchange, you have to have community space in the building. So. 4% of the floor area has to be community space. It's called social and welfare space, actually. And that can be a community room, that can be an exercise room, it can be a computer room, it can be a place to Skype with your grandkids. Um, it can be any number of spaces. Uh, those can also be open to the community, as you said. Can you also maybe provide uh, some examples about senior-friendly design, mm -hmm. and also the difference between senior housing and other type of housing, because I was really surprised a lot of people don't really know what a senior housing look like. Mm -hmm. it, it's good if they don't know what it looks like, because that means it's blending in with the neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Which is what it should do. It shouldn't stick out like a sore thumb. It should be part of the neighborhood. We want our seniors to stay. We want them to be, they're part of our society. They're an incredibly important part. Mm -hmm. So, um, but some of the factors that you'll see in a senior project, um, we try to make sure that uh, all of the bathrooms are handicap accessible, fully accessible. By law, they're not required to be. They have to be adapted. But we try to put them in from day one with all the grab bars and everything, roll in showers, make them absolutely you know, senior friendly from day one. Same thing with the kitchens. Try to make the kitchens adaptable from day one so that someone who moves into that apartment can stay there and use the apartment for years and years. The building itself, everything needs to be accessible. So ramps instead of steps, um, floor transitions that are smooth, um, you know, uh, some understanding of light levels, making sure the light levels are adequate, mm -hmm. making sure signage is large enough. It's really all just good design. It's not something particularly special for seniors. A building designed this way would be good for anybody. Yeah, I think we're looking at this concept of um, universal design mm -hmm. so that every building should have uh, some of these amenities in right. there. And so that if a senior moves in or if um, a young person moves in and mm -hmm. decide to stay there for a long time, which mm -hmm. is happening in, in many of our buildings, and that's why Bobby Wraith is so important. Maybe you could talk about the support of services um, in these buildings, right. senior buildings, but also in regular buildings that we have in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole concept of NORCs, uh, maybe we could explain that a little bit. So, um, <laughs> You know, if you don't have affordable housing, your, your, your life is in turmoil constantly because you're worried about paying the rent or if your landlord's not taking care of the apartment, obviously your environment is, um, is very difficult and, and, and sometimes unhealthy. So when we talk about affordable senior housing, it's also with services, that there be a service coordinator, basically a social worker, in the building and if somebody in the building needs help, maybe now they need to get Meals on Wheels, or they need a van to the doctor, or they need some home care. This would be the connector. This person would be the connector to help them figure out how to get those services, which, by the way, is a great service to the family caregivers. Mm -hmm. 
you know, many caregivers are very stretched in taking care of their elderly parents or relatives. The more services we can bring to people, it, it helps the family caregiver if they're still working, if they're elderly themselves. And so we want people to stay and to build senior housing without these services in them is very short-sighted. It's obvious that at some point if somebody lives there long enough, there's a good chance they're gonna need some services. There is currently no funding stream dedicated to services for seniors in these kinds of buildings. Since these are all nonprofits that run them, they will band-aid together grants and money and they'll put in a social worker in there. But there is no steady stream where there is for some other populations. And so we're saying that these senior buildings need that and we're going to city and state government for that. Then you mentioned NORCs, Naturally Occurring Retirement Communities. <laughs> um, and I know you have a bunch, you know, on the Lower East Side, uh, the Vladic Houses, I think, and there's a bunch of others. Uh, some people are, are uh, the first one was Penn South in, in the Chelsea area. And the Co-op Village. And Co-op Village. Yeah. And, and really what that is, it's a similar model in a way. It's the idea of, again, bringing in social work staff they help identify people in the building that are maybe becoming more frail or more vulnerable. They, they have some activities, recreational or health-related. They'll bring a nurse in, you know, some health-related activities. They'll help sort of organize some volunteers in the building to help out. So again, they're bringing services to the building where people live, um, which is great. And it's, it's been around for quite a while, a couple of decades now. And, you know, everybody says they want to knock in their, in their neighborhood now, so it's obviously a very successful program. And what's really interesting about both of these programs I, I just mentioned is they're not a lot of money. This isn't, you know, upscale assisted living or, you know, nursing homes, which nobody wants to go to unless they're really sick. It's not a hospital. It's where people live, and if you bring in these basic social services, you can prevent a lot of unnecessary health care and people are li living in a safe haven and they're still engaged in the community. At every age, I don't care if you're 20 or you're 90, you have to be engaged with other people and part of a, a community. If you're not, that's when you're isolated. That's when you really get sick, when you're isolated. I was meeting with um, a senior center uh, executive director yesterday and she was telling me that her cook just retired and she was 90 years old. 90 years old. <laughs> and she was loving her job and, right. uh, and it just showed that senior has a lot to contribute. Right. So we just want to make sure that they have a safe place to live, right. yeah. an affordable place to live. Right. And I was talking like by 2030, we're going to be 20% of the population. So we got to make sure that they are able to stay in the neighborhood that they help build. Can mm -hmm. I jump in a, a sure. moment on that? We're already behind. Yeah. The former administration <laughs> did build some affordable housing, but seniors were not high on the agenda. And as Susan rightfully pointed out, I think four years is probably the best, uh, from what I yes. understand, the best bet. <laughs> it can be 10 years, literally. I mean, it's mm -hmm. capital money, and it gets very complicated. And as you said, all the parties have to agree. And so we're looking already years down the road the last 10 years has been very little affordable senior housing built you know when you look at the numbers of people all the existing buildings you build self-help buildings out in, in Queens the buildings in your community they have thousands of people on waiting lists for every one apartment in a new development I, I just heard the other day it's about 150 people applying I mean, it's overwhelming numbers. Mm -hmm. City council members and state officials, the most common call they get is for affordable senior housing. So we can't afford to wait. It's not like we decide today and by next year you open the doors to 50, 60, 100 new apartments. Mm -hmm. It's already years down the road. Mm -hmm. And if we're looking at 20% of, of the city's population being elderly by 2030, I just took us at least halfway down to the 2030. You know what I'm saying? Seven or eight years or more, 10 years. You know, so I think that's really important to keep in mind that we need to be making these decisions now. And if there's land available in a community and it's appropriate to build senior housing, that we just start, that the, that the community comes together. We know sometimes there's difficulty in agreement. But we don't have that luxury of waiting. 
because it's going to take years to complete right. these projects. And the exciting part, right, Susan, is that there will be more project if we could identify the yes, land. Absolutely. Yeah. But there's also, let's not forget about preservation. Mm -hmm. right, so new construction is one piece. Preservation is another huge opportunity in this city. We have people living in apartments that are perfectly happy in their apartment, but as they age, like you said, they need some services brought in. Maybe the building doesn't have a ramp at the front of the building, but it could have a ramp. Um, maybe it only has one elevator and they live on the 17th floor and that's a problem when the one elevator goes down. A couple of years ago the AIA chapter took a look at this idea of aging in place and we did a competition called Booming Burrows. It was a one day workshop. We looked at different kinds of buildings. We looked at you know, one, one, one studio apartment, one three unit building, a six story building, a high rise building. And spent the whole day sort of brainstorming about ideas about how we could keep people in these buildings. If I live on the sixth floor of a six-story building that has one elevator and I'm elderly, I'm at risk because I can't get to the doctor if the elevator's down or if there's a power failure, I can't flush my toilet, I don't have water, etc. Why not allow building owners to convert units on the first floor of a building like that into handicap accessible units so that residents on the older upper floors could move down. Now I stay in my community, I'm around all my friends, I go to the same stores, I'm not disrupted in the same way that I would be if I have to move to a new building. There are opportunities in our cities to really, we have a wonderful city, there are opportunities to preserve people in the houses that they're in. It may be affordable, let's hope, already. Keep them where they're living now, that's half the battle. I'd really like to see that a focus as well. We just, uh, in the city council, we recently passed legislation mm -hmm. uh, creating a guide for building owners um, to sort of get them to be interested to help mm -hmm. kind of fix up, you know, the building, like some of the suggestions that you were talking about, putting railings on the hallways mm -hmm. and maybe improving the lighting to make it more age friendly. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could look towards how to create some incentive for building yeah. owners to do that, to help you know renovate the lower floor apartment to be able to move senior down. We gotta have all kinds of solutions. We have to think because, big. Yeah. And these are not these are not big, big ideas. Mm -hmm. They're just they're pretty simple ideas mm -hmm. and, and we can make them happen if we want to. You know, another thing that's really changed in our society is technology. And for seniors, technology is a uh, a great way to sort of if you're feeling isolated, if you physically can't leave your apartment, you know, self-help has a virtual senior center, right? Yeah. Which um, means that I can go to the senior center sitting in my living room. They set me up with a computer and access and I log on and there's a webcam and I'm engaged. And it's amazing what that program has done for folks who are stuck at home, who are alienated and, you know, it's like I can't imagine what it's like. And uh, so we have technology now that lets us yeah. do things like that that we didn't have even 10 years ago. They can actually do tours of museums yes, and that's uh, right. things that's like right. that. So I think the good. point we're all raising is not to write people off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when people get to whatever the magical age is, we decide you're just <laughs> too old. Or, or they're frail and it is hard for them to leave their house on, on their own. That somehow they just don't matter anymore. And yes, there are solutions. And I, I, so we shouldn't be, as a society, believe that there are no solutions to this. And, I, and I'm, I'm also going to just return for one more moment to the senior, the, now they're calling it the Senior Citizen Rent Freeze Program. Mm -hmm. The city has never done a public awareness campaign on uh, the Senior Citizen Rent Freeze Program. That's why it, it is less than half of the people are um, using it that are eligible. Mm -hmm. You have to be 62, pay one third of your income in rent, and live in rent regulated housing. There are 70,000 people out there. I hope they're all watching. And, and we raise and the, the income and cap. And they raise the income to $50,000, which pretty much covers mostly everybody um, because these are often people that are retired, so they don't have a working income. And we want the city to do the equivalent of a pre K campaign that there are bus stop notices, that you get things in the mail, mm -hmm. that, that there's ads. You know, and even target adult children. If I were on a train or at a bus stop and said, do you want to freeze mom's rent? Mm -hmm. I would be writing very quickly down or putting in my phone, here's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Because again, when you help older adults, you're helping their families also. And 
but this has never happened. The city has never put in a dime to have a concerted public awareness campaign. And the fact that under half of the people eligible for this incredible program uh, are on it is really is really shameful. And it's and it's in a, in a way it th it sort of threatens the lives of all of these seniors who could be more safely housed and preserving, mm -hmm. you know, where they live. So we're going to keep pushing for this. And again, I think it's all <laughs> based on. Does this, the city, but coming down to local communities, do they value keeping older adults in their community? And we're hoping the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. We know there's ageism out there, but I think a lot of people really do want to keep people that have lived in their community for a long time, that they do want to keep them there. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we have to continue to push for that. And one of the things that I'm pushing the city council, I have legislation that I've introduced to mandate the uh, landlord to provide the information about the rent freeze mm -hmm. in the lease renewal that they give to the resident, the okay. seniors, so that the senior will have the information right there. Mm -hmm. And that's the most direct way. So I hope that we can get a, a hearing soon and then get the legislation passed as quickly as possible. And this way, all the seniors who live in rent-regulated apartment can get this information. Sure. Um, so I think that is still very critical. And And we... Live on New York supports that legislation. We need to, again, to, it has to be constant. You can't just send one letter to somebody. They have to be reminded about a program. And, um, and you've been a very strong advocate for programs for older adults as the chair of the aging committee. And, and, and we're grateful for that. And so, again, I know you really have your eye on a whole variety of services intended to keep people in the community. And again, housing is a cornerstone. Yeah. If you're not well housed, safely housed, mm -hmm. if you can't afford your housing, you know, then what's the rest of life about? You, right. you know, you're really threatened every day. There are, oh, for people over the age of 70, 70% 70 of them, because of their low income, can only afford $375 a month if you keep to the one third of your income being affordable. So the, the guideline is nobody should be paying more than one third of their income. And we know people do in New York City. But that's the affordable housing income. So 70% of people over 70, if they're kept to the one third, would only be able to afford $375 a month. I know you've been advocating a rent. That's a pretty rollback. stark. That's <laughs> a pretty stark. So what we're advocating is a rollback. So when somebody gets on to the rent freeze program, they often get on in crisis. They don't know about it. They're already paying 50% of their income in rent. It gets frozen at the 50% level. So they remain on the fiscal cliff. It doesn't go back to the 30%, which would be the one third. And so we're advocating it go back. So could you imagine a public awareness campaign where more people know about SCRI, where it keep, it's kept at the affordable housing level, where it is a universal design, so they are safe and there's some mm -hmm. common sense behind it. None of this sounded like it was that outrageous no. to do. <laughs> and then we really would embrace in keeping older adults in our community. And of course, at the end of the day, we want more housing built, you know. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's continue. what we're here talking about, you know. And so. we got to continue to do that. And right. um, the Live On report is great, you know, because we do have all these, you know, parking lot that was built, you know, attached to a senior building mm -hmm. that can be used for affordable housing mm -hmm. or supportive services. And in my, you know, in my district, we have, you know, city owned facility. Um, I have one site right now on Elizabeth Street that could be turned into affordable housing with open space mm -hmm. for seniors sure. that have helped build a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So we just got to continue to advocate because every city council member, the calls that they get right, sure. is for how do I get into a senior housing? Mm -hmm. So Susan and you got and Bobby, <laughs> we got to really work together. And, and the waiting list, you know, we said it can take <laughs> seven, eight years, whatever, <laughs> to build it. You can be on a waiting list for seven, eight years or more. And if you're already in your 70s, let's say, or older, you don't want to be on a waiting list for anything for seven or eight years, not at that stage of your life. But that's how big, that's how big the demand is. And I think the decision that communities have to make is, you know, do I keep a parking lot with five cars parked? Do I, or do I build a building? 
Right. Do I, you know, do I put in a parking lot with five cars or, or do I build more apartments in that building? Do I keep that piece of land that, okay, so maybe it's being used for something else that, that's a good, you know, it's okay, you know, there's some open space. But maybe it's better that 60 or more seniors mm -hmm. and households, because it, be, it could be more than just 60 people, mm -hmm. live in that building. And it's not just 60 people. It's going to be there, we hope, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're not always easy decisions, and everyone does have their viewpoint. But I think we have to keep our eye on the, on the target here is is it worth it to have a parking lot? Is it worth it to use it? You know, maybe maybe there's a, a garden there, but you know what? I could put 60 seniors in that building. You know, what is that choice when I know that, okay, there's another garden not so far away? Mm -hmm. And and yes, you know, how do we look at this not just from uh, such a personal viewpoint, but what's good for the community and what's good for the people that live in the community? And I think at the end of the day, we're certainly hoping that keeping seniors in their communities is what most people are going to realize. Because one thing we could guarantee, all of us will become seniors, right? Yep. All the young people That's is going to become seniors. So we got to prepare, you know, for the future. Mm -hmm. And I really thank you all, you know, both of you for being here today to sharing your expertise. Uh, so this has been a great discussion. And I thank Bobby and Susan for being here and sharing their expertise on this important issue for our seniors. If you have any questions or suggestions about this or any other issue, please contact me using the information on the screen. I am Margaret Chin, and thank you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network.